It's time to end California's war on fire. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, this story comes to us from Mother Jones, kind of a left-leaning publication. It's been around for many years. And uh, the thrust of the story is, uh, according to some fire experts, that uh, California knows what it needs to do to stop the rampant wildfires that have torn apart the state, uh, particularly this year, uh, but it refuses to do so. And what it needs to do is start more fires. It also needs to stop trying to put out fires that it calls, that they call good fires and actually create what they call a black and green checkerboard that provides uh, dampers and dead ends to wildfires when they arise. Uh, Bill, in 2017, 2018, California spent some $773 million in firefighting efforts. This year, it looks like it may be a billion dollars, could be their first billion dollar firefighting season. What do you think of this idea that it's time to stop the war on fire? Uh, by myself, not often agreeing with Mother Jones, but what, what we're really talking about here is not stopping the war on fire. It's talking about starting a war on fire that you have a chance to win. Uh, it, it's talking about an intelligent uh, approach to dealing with the fact that Southern California is an enormously uh, heavily populated area that is a desert and that's water comes from the outside and that that while the actual city grid uh, where people live in suburbs and so on is pretty green or concrete, the huge majority of the area surrounding there is filled with seasonal brush that grows like weeds because that's what they are for about a month or two in the spring and then we don't get any rain for eight months, nine months and it turns into the perfect fire fuel. It's thin, it's dry, it's and there's a lot of it, it's dense. Um, any realistic, intelligent plan to deal with fires would be doing pretty much what they're talking about. Building a burning, rather burning, a, a, a controlled burn around these populated areas wasn't, uh, I don't know, they said this last year was bad, but there's two years ago, I want to say that where, where they finally, a fire killed hundreds, if not thousands of people out in Malibu. Usually we get away with 20 fatalities, which is not a great number, but given the scale of these things is a little more in line. But my point is this, this would require two things, maybe three, that California does not have. Uh, the thing it might not have is the money for it. The two things it definitely doesn't have is the intelligence to face it and the political will to execute it. Because what they're talking about doing in order to, to actually save this from happening in the future is they're talking about going out there and lighting controlled fires with all of the guns around it to make sure that it doesn't get out of the boundaries, putting areas where the fire cannot cross because there's no fuel there, we burned the fuel. Uh, and California has neither the will, the political will to do that, nor do they have the uh, political intelligence to do that. And I'm pretty sure they don't have the money to do it either. Sometime early in the last century, uh, the idea began to arise that this war on fire was the best way to deal with things. Um, if you believe academic research in California's prehistoric days, before people were writing things down, um, some 4.4 to 11.8 million acres a year would normally burn. Um, in 1982 through 1998, the state burned only about 30,000 acres a year. And then in 1999 through 2017, state agencies burned some 13,000. So they're actually doing fewer and fewer controlled fires, as it appears. Uh, Bill, it's not enough just to say that, uh, you know, the people in control of government are not smart enough. What is the political opposition to doing what fire experts know is necessary? It's a great example of, of, of why California in particular and the West in general is in a state of decline. They're not, everybody wants everything all the time and nobody wants to pay for anything. And when I say pay for anything, I don't mean pay for it financially, although they don't want to do that either. Let's take a much more um, easily understandable example of this, which uh, I want to say is at least 10 year old story now or so on. Yellowstone National Park is, is, a, is a wilderness, obviously. And I'm, I'm virtually positive it was Yellowstone. And for a hundred years, the Parks Department decided that they didn't want to have any fires in Yellowstone because fires were bad. And so when a fire would start as a result of a lightning strike, they would simply put it out. And the result was this, all of that little brush that normally grows around the big trees and which generally burns out every few years when lightning strikes a tree and a, and a bushfire starts. 
Prior to man's intervention, those little bushfires would be common. And since they were common, there wasn't so much fuel. The trees in Yellowstone had evolved to be able to withstand some pretty serious fire damage. And that was nature. And it was like that way for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. But then along comes mankind and decides, no, we don't want fires in Yellowstone. So whenever a, a lightning fire would start, it was put out immediately. The result of this was that over the course of nearly a hundred years, that undergrowth became so dense, there was so much of it because it hadn't been cleared by regular fire. And it became so dense and so rich in fuel that when finally a fire came that we couldn't control, there was so much fuel there, artificially there, because we had put out the fires that had normally burned through there on a regular basis. There was so much undergrowth there that now, when the fire finally came and got out of control, it destroyed the trees that normally could weather a, a, a typical relatively routine fire. It burned them down because there was so much fuel, fuel there. If you, that example is a little easier to understand, but basically what it comes down to is this. There is, there is something about a fire, and I know what it is. Uh, we, we like to think that fires are preventable and, and to, to a large degree they are. If, Somebody were to say, to give you an idea of, 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 the, of the psychological problem, if somebody were to say that, hey, we have a machine that can prevent hurricanes from striking uh, the Atlantic coast, and we can turn this thing on, uh, and we can probably protect the Atlantic coast for 20 or 30 years, but eventually, if we turn this thing on, a storm is going to develop that is going to be so much more powerful than anything we've ever seen, it's going to come in and just destroy everything. The psychological problem then comes when you have to deal with the fact that when a regular hurricane comes ashore, people say, why didn't you turn on the hurricane protector? I don't know if I'm being clear about this, but what people don't want to tolerate is they don't want to go outside and see California burning. They assume it's just a result of, of, of human inhab inhabitation, but it's not. It's, it's a desert. It's a wildland here. And so in order for this plan, which is sensible and practical, would save lives and property and money, in order for it to work, there have to be human beings going out there and setting fires and having all that ugly smoke on the horizon and all the rest of those things that offend Southern Californians' uh, aesthetic sensibilities so much. And nobody wants to do that, Scott. No one has the guts to do it. And no one has the respect for, when I say respect for science, I'm not talking about in the political sense. Nobody is willing to, to understand the fundamentals of this. And ultimately, when you get right down to it, the, the final problem here is that even more than the rest of this country. Every, Californians want everything all the time and they don't want to pay for any of it. And paying for it means you got to go out there and burn things down on a regular basis under control so that it doesn't get out of control. And when it does, things get very, very bad out here. The reason cited in the Mother Jones article, um, and at least in the, the paragraph that I'm citing here, kept it kind of vague, include the following, the reasons why they don't engage in a much more aggressive, good fire strategy um, are culture, greed, liability laws, and good intentions. I hadn't mentioned the liability laws, although I was about to. Um, you would then have to ask yourself if we're going to control the spread of wildfires here by going out and, and doing controlled burns and setting up fire breaks and so on. What happens then if it turns out that the state of California sends somebody out, a fireman, with, with a lot of support, sends them out into an area to start a controlled burn, that gets out of control and, and burns somebody's house down. Uh, then is the state of California liable for this? I suspect people would be clamoring to say that they were. And so we don't get an intelligent uh, a response to it for yet another reason. And you said uh, good intentions? Yes, that was one of the yeah, reasons. Well, good, good. you know, it's funny. I, I never really thought about this and I certainly didn't think about it till just this second. But this is actually a pretty good, um, in fact, it's an excellent example of of, of what's wrong with California and what's wrong with the liberal mindset. When you say they it's partially a result of good intentions, it's a result of people thinking that what seems to be obvious is the right thing to do when all the evidence indicates that the obvious thing to do is not only not the right thing to do, it's catastrophically bad. In other words, Californians think that, well, there are poor people out there and homeless people out there, so we're going to have a city like Santa Monica that's going to have, we're not going to kick homeless people out anywhere, we're not going to, we're just going to let them be. Next thing you know, every homeless person in America is in Santa Monica. Uh, and, and the same thing is true here. People think that, that the, 
that the thing to do when you see a fire is put it out. And it doesn't take a lot. I hopefully we've accomplished this in 10 minutes to explain why sometimes you have to let something that looks bad happen because it prevents something that's worse. You know, what you're that's describing utterly beyond. reminds me of an incident a few weeks ago. I was out on a local lake here in Texas in a boat and a thunderstorm came up. And at first we thought we could outrun it to the south. So we headed totally. south, but it was clear that it was bigger than we thought. And so then we saw that it was kind of sunny to the north and we turned around and headed back to the north, but then it got even bigger. And finally, uh, we thought, well, maybe we can cling to the shore and just stay close to the shore and, and reduce the risk of being in deep water during the middle of a storm. But that seemed pretty scary, too. And Bill, ultimately, I found that the best solution was to turn the boat directly into the storm and to drive through it as fast as I could. Now, in the course of doing that, which, by the way, I found incredibly exciting, uh, yeah, me too. We had a lightning strike behind us. My son estimated about 100 feet behind us and a sound like I've never heard before. But Bill, that whole strategy of, of starting fire to fight fire or driving into the storm, so to speak, is just so antithetical to our, our base instinct, our primordial desire to avoid danger. You're true. Th that's true. But one of the aspects of, of humans in general and uh, Americans, at least formally, I hate having to constantly qualify everything I say, but there we are, is that is that courage is the face, courage is the ability to do something uh, that needs to be done even though it's scary. Courage, as many people have pointed out, is not the lack of fear. Courage is overcoming your fear to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And, and so sailing into a storm, if that's the best way to ride out the storm, requires courage. Burning fires that weren't burning before in order to prevent uncontrolled wildfires requires courage. And the best way to think about this and the lack of courage that is endemic in California and spreading around the entire country, the simplest way for you to think about this is something everybody can relate to. And this is the, what I like to call the, tooth, the toothache paradox. Uh, if you have a toothache, and, and it's starting to get worse, it's starting to get bad, it's no longer annoying, it's something that's really bothering you. You basically have uh, two choices. You can go to the dentist and either get a root canal, which is exceedingly unpleasant, or an extraction, which is also unpleasant, or you can let it continue. And, and nobody goes to the dentist as a patient voluntarily. I have yet to meet a person who said, you know, I think maybe during my two weeks off, what I wanna do is go have a root canal. There's nobody in the world that wants to go to the dentist when their teeth are hurting. Nobody wants to go. They know it's going to be unpleasant. They know it's going to hurt. But adults, grown-ups, understand that if we don't go to the dentist, this is not going to get better over time. It's going to get worse. It's going to continue to get worse. It's going to spread. And so adults somehow, through the, through the mysteries of, of human consciousness, are able to summon the courage to drive themselves towards pain and discomfort without a gun to their head because they're adult enough to understand that this brief period of relatively intense pain is much better than in the long term and even in the relative short term than endless ongoing aching pain that never ever goes away, but at least you don't have to face it. You don't have to confront it. And this is the essence of all of our problems. We know that the country is, is exposed to EMP attack, but we don't do anything about it because it hasn't happened yet. And the same thing was with the pandemic uh, preparations and, and, and all of the other things that have happened and will happen. We don't do it because most of us would rather put up with a toothache than, than go to the dentist. And it is a function of, of being an adult. And this is the term I keep coming back to. This is what this is the definition of the difference between an adult and a child is that a child will never drive itself to greater pain to get rid of pain over the long term because it can't comprehend these things. It just knows it's going to hurt at the dentist. An adult is somebody that can use their experience and their reason to understand that this is what has to be done now and they do it. And we don't have any adults in California anymore. Well, experts estimate that some 20 million acres would have to be burned at this point in California in order to just reach equilibrium or stability. Uh, we are grateful to the members at BillWhittle.com who have made this show possible. They contribute on a monthly or annual basis to actually fund this enterprise. They also create their own content 
at BillWhittle.com on the member blog and in vigorous discussions under each of our shows here. I saw somebody this morning on YouTube complaining that YouTube is no longer sending out email notifications and apparently this person's mobile notifications weren't working and uh, we assured that person that uh, if they came to BillWhittle.com and became a member, they would get five days a week emails that would let you know when a new video has been posted and they're always posted at BillWhittle.com first, so make sure you don't miss a thing. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.